Well, thank you everyone and let's get started. My name is Beth Lander and I'm the treasurer of the Medical Heritage Library as well as the managing director of the Philadelphia Area Consortium of Special Collections Libraries. On behalf of the MHL and its board of directors, I would like to welcome you to the second of our four talks in our, in our inaugural, excuse me, Spring Speakers Series. For those unfamiliar with the Medical Heritage Library, we are a collaborative digitization and discovery organization committed to providing open access to the history of medicine and health resources. Beginning in 2009, the MHL has aspired to be a research-driven history of medicine and health community that serves a broad interdisciplinary constituency. Today's event, like all those in the speaker series, illustrates the rich ways the MHL corpus supports research. Before I introduce Tricia, just a couple of housekeeping items. First, this webinar is being recorded. Second, if you have questions for the speaker, please enter them in the chat and I'll present them to Tricia as part of the Q&A. Third, we'd like to extend special thanks to the Harvard Medical School for co-hosting this event. Finally, we invite you to learn more about our upcoming talks in the series. Descriptions and registration links are available on our website at www.medicalheritage.org. Now I'm pleased to welcome Trisha Halder from Kolkata, India. She has completed her graduation, History with Honors, from Bethune College, Kolkata, and is post-graduation from the University of Calcutta. She has a keen interest in the history of medicine, and so did her MPhil in this area from Jadapur University, Kolkata. At present, I'm sorry, at present, she is an assistant professor at Goshpakur University, Shiliguri. Her talk today is entitled Western Medicine in the Face of the Scourge of the Fevers of Bengal. And I'll turn it over to Trisha. Hello, uh, my name is Trisha Haldar. And today I'm going to, uh, let me share the screen with you first. Today I'm going to speak on this topic, Western medicine in the face of uh, scourge of the fevers of Bengal, 1715 to 1857. Actually, this is a part of my dissertation, which I did an uh, MPhil dissertation. And let me begin with it. Now, uh, let's start with this. Uh, following the Battle of uh, Plassey in 1757, um, it was the first gain for the English East India Company over Bengal territory. And, but instead of rejoicing over this uh, uh, political gain, and also they also had certain economic gains, but instead of rejoicing over this, they faced with a critical situation as the company lost many of its dutiful officials like uh, Admiral Watson, Major Kilpatrick, and several other members of the battalion to the underlying disease of Bengal and not to the war. This disease was none other than a uh, fever. As per the present day medical terminology, fever is no longer deemed to be a disease. Uh, this rise in temperature of the body and also the disturbances it creates uh, due to the rise of, uh, in the bodily functions, uh, it serves fever uh, is, in, is an indicator of disease within the body and not the disease itself. Okay, this is what the present day medical terminology says. But in Calcutta, since 1757, uh, fever attained the fame of the most fatal disease. And this can also be traced in the works of the earliest naval surgeons like those of uh, Edward Ives, uh, 1757, then of Surgeon Boak. And also the Fort William official documents uh, uncovers uh, that the large number of deaths that occurred during this period were all due to fever. Yet such uh, deaths did not force the company to just vacate their newly won capital uh, 
So uh, rather the medical professionals working under the English uh, East India Company, they played a crucial role to combat this febrile fatality. Thus, uh, considering their con contribution, taking into account their contribution, today I shall be uh, discussing how the medics working under the English East India Company through their medical skills brought this critical situation under their control. And specifically, I shall be uh, talking about those popular medications that were adopted by the medical practitioners of the time, that is between 1757 to 1857. And uh, particularly, I have referred to uh, the works of the surgeons and uh, these works are in this uh, lockdown period. Uh, these works are available. Uh, I've got full access to these works through the Med uh, Medical Heritage Library, and I'm very grateful to them. Okay. Now, for the ease of our understanding, I have classified the entire company period into three phases. Now, coming to the first phase, that is uh, from... Uh, the uh, early 1760s to uh, the uh, uh, early uh, 1790s. So in the initial days of, um, in the initial days of uh, uh, company med uh, English company in Bengal, following the series of Oriental Wars, um, the administrative system at that juncture uh, was not that good, especially the healthcare services was not much impressive. Although the Bengal Medical Service did took shape in 1764, so still not many members uh, could devote their attention uh, uh, to understand this fatality. Why? Because most of the surgeons were either involved in the Oriental Wars in other parts of the subcontinent, like in the Anglo-Mysore War or in the Anglo-Maratha War. And also if uh, we take a look at DJ Crawford's role of the Indian Medical Service, uh, volume one, from 1615 to 1930. Uh, in that work, uh, uh, it lists it lists all the surgeons who were appointed in Bengal since, uh, from 1615 to 1930. And if we take a look at that uh, work, we, we, we shall see that uh, most of the surgeons, they were uh, apothecaries, they were not medically trained. Okay, so there was, uh, the company was in dire need of good professional surgeons. So to get rid of this critical situation caused by the disease, uh, initially the Metropole Medical Service had to intervene as for the company, this initial gain um, at Bengal in the words of PJ Marshall was not just an Indian regional state, it was a British national possession. So to protect their newly won capital, uh, surgeons, uh, uh, were appointed from the Metropole Medical Service. Hence, the earliest records that we have on the fevers on Bengal were, those, were by those medics who were members of the Metropole, uh, uh, Metropolitan Sea Service and were appointed to the East Indiamen coming to Calcutta. Being the first informants of the disease, their work served to be the guide for the subsequent surgeons. Okay, now the first treatise was by the naval surgeon of the Drake Indiamen, James Lind, Although his work came in print by the year 1772, but the foremost page of his account shows that uh, it records the outbreak of the fever in, that, uh, in Bengal that occurred in the year 1762, and it occurred in an epidemic form. This is the first page, uh, first page of uh, James Lynn's account. Uh, from here, one, uh, we may see that uh, it's, a it's a dissertation translated from Latin. So, and... Um, if uh, we go uh, through this account, uh, we shall see that in the very uh, preface of this account, he mentions that when he came to Bengal, he was just a medical trainee and uh, not a fully skilled medical professional. Uh, so his account, from his account, it can be expected that it was basically his observation of what he saw at that juncture and he did not uh, contribute any new medical uh, ideas which uh, the subsequent surgeons have contributed. Okay, now the second work was by his namesake, whose, uh, whose name was again, um, James Lind, um, but uh, he was basically known for his, an essay on the most effectual means of, um, most effectual means uh, regarding the uh, Royal Navy and uh, his, uh, since he was uh, 
uh, he tra he got his medical training in 1757. So in the medical circles of Europe, he was basically uh, given the prefix of senior. He was so he was referred as Senior Lind. So when Senior Lind visited uh, India, uh, he uh, devoted a small section um, to the disease that was taking place in Calcutta, and this we may find in his work an essay on the diseases incidental to Europeans in hot climates published in 1768. Now the third work was by the naval surgeon of the Talbot India men, uh, John Clark. When the, and this work uh, came into being when the mortalities uh, that were resulting due to the fevers of Bengal, they remained unaltered. Then the, by the order of the court of directors of the East India Company, Clark was sent to India to write a more comprehensive account on the fevers in Bengal that is observation on the diseases in long voyages to hot countries and particularly on those which prevail in the East Indies in 1775. Basically from their works, it can be seen that actually uh, the Metropolitan uh, Medical Service, they were trying to identify that what type of fever it is, okay, what disease was it that it was um, causing so much of deaths. Now, all these three works by the naval surgeons of the Metropolitan Medi uh, Marine Medical Service had um, some uh, similar characteristics uh, since they were all coming from the same um, uh, medical service. And they shared the attributes uh, of a typical medical topography that stressed the role of environment, specifically miasma or putrid exhalations from the marshy spots by locating the cause of the disease. Okay, this miasma uh, as cause of the disease uh, is basically, uh, it was uh, popularized by uh, the Edinburgh University professor, William Cullen, and they were much influenced by this. A major point of difference um, among the three work was that uh, Clark, who was present in Calcutta between 1768 to 1771, chose an empirical method to comprehend the disease. Although Clark claims uh, the futility of dissection, uh, yet it assisted him in identifying the chief organs that were affected. Now, further in Clark's work, we also come to know uh, um, that uh, he mentions the um, number of patients who recovered by his treatment process. So we see that um, the medical case histories in Bengal before um, uh, these surgeons, medical case histories could not be located. So with Clark, we find that for the first time, medical case histories were also taken down. And he mentions that out of 150 registered patients, most of them were successfully treated with the Peruvian Sincona bark, and uh, he lost only one unregistered patient. This Peruvian Sincona bark, since the uh, late 17th century, it had won, um, I mean, it was uh, highly acclaimed by the surgeons for its therapeutic abilities. Okay, it was considered the only febrifuge which can treat all kinds of fevers. Now, not only Clark, even in the work of his predecessors, Peruvian Sincona bark was highly praised. Okay, now at, uh, yet at times, the Sincona did produce some negative results. It could be accounted to the, uh, to the fact that since uh, the availability of bark was quite irregular due to its high uh, demand, so often it got adulterated and uh, consequently produced negative results. Under such critical circumstances, trials with mercury drugs were started in different parts of the country. Although Clark tested with mercury for uh, diseases like dysentery and also the venereal diseases, but not fevers. Okay, so still he found, uh, he never advocated it in medications because he, he found that there was certain um, negative impact on the body. Now, mercury-based drugs came to be adopted from the time of Francis Buffoon. He was the first medical professional from the Bengal Medical Service who wrote on the fevers of this province. But his work could not create a strong impression in the medical circle as he tried to demonstrate an illusionary, a fanciful link between the fevers and the full and change of mood. Still, uh, Bafu's work is important because he brought a crucial change in the treatment process. Okay, in the milder forms of fever, he first introduced calomel. He was the first surgeon. Okay, and in a more violent version of the disease, the patient was exhibited with a dosage of bark and opium. Overall, we see that uh, 
by the approach of the 1790s, the treatment in Bengal was purely dependent on Sinkona Ba, and dissections, though, were practiced, but they failed to earn its due importance. Now, in the second phase, that is from uh, 1790s to the 1830s, uh, they were a landmark year. Okay, they, this was a landmark in the history of Western medicine in Bengal, solely due to the extensive practice of dissection, uh, which immensely contributed in broadening their knowledge uh, regarding the disease, as it helped the uh, surgeon to understand as to what went wrong with the treatment process and how the fevers were affecting the body internally. It also depicted the empiricist uh, nature of the medical practice of the surgeons appointed to Calcutta during this period. There were also, um, uh, in this decade, I mean, uh, from 1790s to 1830s, uh, throughout this period, there were also ma uh, marked changes in the realm of therapeutics. From this period onwards, few surgeons began to denigrate the efficacious quality of the Sinkona bark and res uh, resorted to the uh, toxic calomel or mercurial-based drugs. Um, it was done so because uh, not only there were, not only um, the Sinkona bark gave uh, some negative results, but also um, many a times the Sinkona actually came from Europe. It was supplied from Europe. So what happened was is that uh, many a times it uh, 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 arrived in India, arrived uh, in a very tampered condition that it could not be medicated. It was not in a position to be medicated. Okay, so for all these problems, um, uh, they switched to calomel. Now, juxtaposed to it, uh, many indigenous medicinal preparations were also introduced, about which we sh uh, shall be discussing in the subsequent sections. Now, such changes can be first traced in the work of surgeon uh, John Peter Wade in his a paper on the prevention and treatment of disorders of seamen and soldiers in Bengal, published in 1793. To comprehend the disease in a better manner, Wade often anatomized the body of his dead patients. In fact, uh, when uh, during his presence in Calcutta, when he encountered an uh, unknown type of fever, means it uh, the fever that caused a yellow tinge over uh, the body of the patient. And even after... Um, uh, medicating him with him with uh, the medicines available at that time when the patient died so what uh, Wade did what uh, did was that he anatomized the body he found that the main affection was in the liver okay so this shows that how dissection was taking place into the indian uh, medical circle and it is something very novel as because at that time uh, dissection was not even legally sanctioned in britain okay but unfortunately, dissections could not turn into a popular diagnostic measure as the dead body often went into a decaying state in the hot and sultry climate of Bengal. Now, as far as the medication was concerned, Wade sharply, he was against the therapeutic measures which were adopted in the Calcutta General Hospital where they chiefly invested in bark and that ended up causing more deaths. Among all the known treatments at that period, Wade uh, tried with all the treatments available and he found this purging to be the best means for curing all varieties of fevers. And to uh, for this purging, he found the mercury-based calomel to possess the desirable therapeutic value. Now, uh, Wade's prescriptions also included uh, the Indian medicine, the uh, cut kolegi. Uh, basically, it was a kind of country medicine which was uh, known to offer uh, effective results in cases of intermittence. And it was, uh, it was held with great esteem among the inhabitants and was also, uh, it was uh, medicated. Uh, through this, it was medicated to the Europeans as well. Uh, in this respect, it is worth to be noted that uh, by the middle of the 18th century, the bazaar or country medicines, as they were called, were being adopted in many parts of India. And in Bengal, Wade's work first apprises us regarding the employment of such medicines. Basically, the bazaars and country medicines at this period were, uh, they were explored uh, so that uh, it could uh, reduce the cost of the company's expenses. Okay. Now, following Wade, uh, the next important work on the subject of Bengal fevers was by the naval surgeon James Johnson, who was chiefly known for his the influence of tropical climates, more especially the climate of India on European constitution, 
which was first published in 1813. And this work was held in great esteem uh, in the medical circle and it uh, went through six editions up to 1841. This is the image of James Johnson. Now, James Johnson, he, he was basically, he was famous uh, by because he introduced into the treatment process high dosage of calomel. Um, and apart from calomel, um, uh, okay, this high dosage of calomel was like that he, uh, the patient was offered calomel as um, in such a degree that uh, after two to three hours, he used to salivate. Okay, like, so like this, um, he inter this mercurialization of the treat. He brought the mercurialization in the febrile treatment. Now, apart from calomel, Johnson also drew the attention of his fellow practitioners towards indigenous therapeutics. Some of the medicines were like uh, the black purging salt, popularly known as beet nobin, which served as a uh, cathartic. He also mentions the cut karanja nut, which probably uh, resembled the cut kuliji that Wade used in the treatment of fevers. And Johnson opined that it possessed greater power than uh, the cinchona bark. Further, he also mentions about chireta, which is widely available in the uh, popular markets of Bengal at that juncture. Now, incorporation of these of the indigenous medicines into Western medical practice in the late 18th and early 19th century was a result of Orientalist scholarship, especially it was on the insistence of William Jones. He uh, stressed on the need to realize the uh, ingredients used in Indian medicines, as well as the medical practice of countries, physicians, when uh, it was found that the bark was not yielding good results. Okay, so consequently, many indigenous plants were explored and examined. Now, following Johnson, the next important surgeon was William Twining, who was chiefly known for stressing the need uh, for anatomizing the body, but in a novel manner. Unlike the surgeons who have preceded him, Twining considered that both the post-mortem examination as well as the visible symptoms of the disease patient were important to understand the disease. Since the body after death underwent uh, many changes and in those days there was no refrigeration process, uh, there was no refrigeration process for the body. So just uh, in the hot and sultry climate of Bengal, the body underwent changes. Okay, what, the, what uh, affection it had uh, uh, it changed to some other part of the body. So for an accurate pathological observation, Twining pointed up the need to pursue uh, a comparative study uh, between the visual symptoms of the diseased body in its living status and a deep study of the anatomized body. Though Twining retained the medication uh, with calomel, uh, but he also introduced, introduced uh, Peruvian bark in a very restricted manner. The only difference was that now the red variety of Peruvian bark was employed. Further, he also exhibited his patients with the Indian drugs. Uh, unlike his um, predecessors, Twining uh, administered it mostly to his Indian patients. Whereas the Europeans were offered indigenous medicinal preparations only when they produced exceptionally good results. It may be mentioned in this respect that uh, Twining was the, up to now, Twining was the only surgeon of Bengal who had a private practice and there he treated the Indians. And um, while treating Indians, there were many cases of deaths and he uh, anatomized their body and he found uh, the enlargement of spleen in the Indian bodies. And also while treating the Indian patients, he found that they had a very uh, low rate of recovery from diseases. So it made him opine that the Indian community possessed a very big body. So from the time of twining, we see that the Indian and European patients, they were segregated and they were medicated on the basis of their race. And basically the Indian patients were always, they were provided with a moderate dosage of, okay, moderate version of medicines compared to the Europeans. Okay, now coming to the last phase of company medicine that is from 1830s up to the year 1857, it marks the terminal years of company's rule in India. And for the company, these two decades were very much different from the earlier years as by the Charter Act of 1833, the company's right to trade was abolished and it turned into a governing corporation. 
So uh, uh, from uh, 1834 onwards, the administrative role of the company began to attain much importance. And as a part of this administration, it often interfered in the choice of prophylaxis, which was to be undertaken in Bengal. In therapeutics, one positive changes that took place during this period was that gradually the surgeons started to drop calomel from their prescriptions, solely due to the toxic effects it produced in the body. Now, it is pertinent to be mentioned in this respect that since the beginning of the 19th century, patients at the Calcutta General Hospital, they often complained about soreness of mouth after mercurial dosage, and uh, but their cry went to deaf ears. Uh, years later, in 1816, the negative impact of excessive calomel dosage was brought uh, in front of people by the surgeon A. Halliday, who was involved in publishing articles on the usage of calomel in the hospital. In one such article, Halliday wrote how in a single case of fever, a patient was advocated with calomel that ranged between 800 to 900 grains. He also showed how excessive dosage of calomel was linked to deaths, but no attention was paid to such reports. Here's a table which shows this is the time period um, that is from 1st May 1816 to 30th April uh, 1817. In the very first column, the cases treated were 1,063. And to each patient around 102, 8 by 9 uh, grains of calomel were given. And there was one in... Uh, one death in every eight by three fourth of cases. So it shows that how uh, how poisonous the calomel was, but still uh, the medical circle at uh, Calcutta uh, they hardly paid any attention uh, to uh, what he said, and instead the calomel treatment continued for long. With the approach of the eighteen thirties. A uh, few surgeons like from different parts of the India, like William Geddes and also uh, most importantly are twining from Bengal, they complained in their respective reports about uh, um, the mercurial rheumatism and other several negative impacts on the body when they treated with mercurial medicines. The reluctance to use mercurial drugs was also due to the fact that the surgeons in Bengal were more inclined to re-employ the red variety of cinchona work and its derivatives, that is quinine and sulfate of quinine, which by this period attained high acclimation and endorsement from uh, the medical practitioners at the Metropole. It may be mentioned that when bark was uh, discontinued in India and also in other colonies, um, then uh, the medical practitioners uh, in the Metropole they continued with the testing of the bark and uh, this red variety was found to yield good results in treatment of intermittent fevers. And thereafter in 1820 under Pelletier and Cavento, uh, the uh, uh, quinine was extracted from it. Okay, and from there, the Indian surgeons were also, especially those in Bengal, uh, they were also interested to apply it in treatment. Um, twining was the first to introduce cinchona and sulfate of quinine, but uh, it has to be remembered that not all surgeons had the opportunity to medicate their patients with cinchona and its derivatives. Despite its high therapeutic value, the company administration in India, at least during this period, did not officially authorize its usage. Why? Because uh, since the British Empire had no colonial bases in the South American continent and the therapeutic qualities of cinchona called for its heavy demands throughout the world. So buying excessive cinchona meant uh, intolerable pressure onto their finances. Therefore, uh, while cinchona was used very sparingly in the treatment, <clears throat> um, the government also uh, asked the surgeons to ask the surgeons and other officials to look out for alternatives to cinchona. As substitutes to cinchona, chiefly the Indian febrifuges were examined by officials like H. Piddington, and consequently, a number of works were also published. For instance, um, in 1833, George Playfair, who was then a member of the Calcutta Medical Board, he came up with his work, uh, Talif Sharif, uh, translated from an 18th century work on the Indian drugs by Hakim Sharif Khan. Playfair drew his attention to some Yunani drugs which were used in the treatment of fevers like in the rain, gillo, suva, suderi, par, bhapungi, and 
flowering plants like kans and kashmiri in fact clefio also claims that he used this gillo uh, he and his father who was also a doctor uh, they used this gillo in the treatment of intermittents and they found quite good results it by far the most important contribution on indian medicines took place under william brook or shaughnessy who joined the company's bengal medical service as an assistant surgeon in 1833 and since then he was involved in publishing a number of articles on the efficacy of indian medicinal plants his interest led uh, his interest in indian plants also made him the member of the committee which was asked to report about um, you know, all those indian indigenous remedies uh, okay which um, alternatives which could be uh, which were uh, only procurable from other countries okay now the exploration of drugs uh, the exploration of indian medicines it contributed greatly it opened uh, i mean uh, uh, a new no knowledge for the new uh, medicinal knowledge for the europeans for instance uh, they were now uh, um, they were now familiar with berberis after numerous experiments it was found that the water extract or rhizote from the sliced root stem and branches of this plant it acted as a febrifuge with which they uh, had treated more than 30 cases of complicated tertian ague and in, in its place shaughnessy also remarks that on the whole we deem the rhizot a most uh, important accession to our materia medica and worthy of being substituted in a multitude of cases for cinchona bark further there were many other indigenous plants like azadi rajta indica or the commonly known as neem okay then todalia bhungi etc many uh, were found effic uh, efficacious in fevers there was gulanch also and uh, rohuna they were found uh, to be a uh, very efficacious and uh, similar to that of cinchona capable of replacing cinchona but despite such findings on most of the occasions indian medicines continued to be used on the indian body uh, if we uh, take a look at a woods report what he did was he was a military surgeon and posted in damdam and uh, once when there was a, a outbreak of remittent fever he treated most of the indian native troops with uh, this uh, gulanch and uh, uh, gulanch and uh, uh, left and he claims that he left the cinchona the quinine for the european patients so this shows that uh, that the um, the racism in medicine which twining has inaugurated it was uh, carried forward by the subsequent surgeons and moreover uh, the indian uh, medicines they were basically treated on the indian patients we come to know about them uh, from the fact that these medicaments were basically um, uh, the indian medicaments were administered by the western trained indian sub assistant surgeons in the company's charitable dispensaries that were meant to serve the indigenous population so it may be presumed that uh, the introduction of such drugs in western medicine was also meant to popularize to make the western medicine more appreciable to the indian populace now juxtaposed to it from 1845 onwards the use of cinchona based medicines was gaining much more momentum especially for the europeans and uh, for the indian cinchona was uh, quite minimally used as it was believed that the excessive dosage of quinine on or cinchona uh, could cause uh, cause health complications amongst them um, because of their delicate body up to 1845 uh, cinchona was used along with calomel basically cinchona was used uh, in the very last stages of fever and uh, but with the coming of uh, with coming of edward hare uh, the cinchona gained uh, uh, cinchona the use of cinchona gained new momentum okay since uh, his joining uh, the bengal medical service in 1839 hare repeatedly experimented with the traditional method of treatments of fevers in bengal in other words he tried to revive the medication prescribed by lind and clark okay so a question may naturally arise as to why hare did so in all probability here was dismayed by the death rates caused due to calomel dosage as per the statistics of the general hospital at calcutta 
between 1826 to 33, out of uh, every six uh, cases of fevers, there was one death. Between 1846 to 50, out of uh, every three cases of fevers, there was one death. And from uh, 1820 to 50, there were about 600 cases of death by fever alone. So he thought that there was definitely something wrong with the treatment process, uh, with the medication specifically. So here, after conducting the required trials with uh, Sinkona Bach, he finally came up with a very fierce uh, position in his work, uh, which was uh, hints for an improved treatment of remitting fever published in 1847. And as per the journals of the time, uh, whatever uh, his uh, work revolutionized the therapeutics of fevers in Bengal. He not only critically condemned Johnson's medication, who vocaled about uh, the, large, uh, the uh, large dosage of calomel, but also he emphatically stated that give bark as our fathers did. Okay, now here proved uh, the efficacy of Sincona after experimental analysis, he was asked by the government to prove his assertions. And after an year long experimental analysis, both at the Calcutta General Hospital, where out of 129 patients, only uh, one uh, died. And in the Garrison Hospital in Fort William, where out of a uh, total 292 cases, only two that suffered. Uh, okay, so it was reported to the government um, that uh, the recovery period in Hare's treatment was much lesser than the other medications. Impressed by Hare's analysis, then the Governor General Lord Dalhousie wrote to the Court of Directors to introduce cultivation of Sincona in India. Since Hare's prescribed medications required a heavy dosage of Sincona, um, so it could increase financial strain on the company if they had to purchase it from Europe. Moreover, under the government initiative, about 500 copies of Hare's praxis were distributed amongst the medical men of India. Uh, in the years preceding the revolt of 1857, that is from 1853 to 1856, uh, between this time slot, despite much attempts by J.F. Royal, a surgeon of the Bengal Medical Service, Sincona cultivation could not be introduced in India before 1857 as because J.F. Royal died. Still, arrangements were made to administer Sincona and quinine to the European troops. From the tabular analysis furnished by Joseph Evote, he shows how Sincona dosage assisted in preventing uh, from deaths. This is the tabular so dosage. In the very first um, column, uh, the, the Bengal, we can see that from 1833 to 1853 to 54, the total strength, uh, uh, out of the total strength, there were around 2,38,634 admissions, and the deaths were, uh, were about 4,539. The uh, 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 Joseph Evert basically tried to draw attention to the percentage of deaths to admission, and it was, uh, uh, it, uh, it was around 1.902, uh, which was quite less. So he tried to basically show that how, um, with the introduction of Sincona, uh, the death rates uh, got uh, reduced. But at the same time, this table also demonstrates that the therapeutic, uh, the virtues of the Western medicine, they were basically, they were reserved for the European troops. So coming to the conclusion of my talk, um, it is perceptible that there were uh, several shifts and turns in the treatment process adopted by surgeons working under the English company in Bengal. Uh, the treatments, the prophylaxis, which was to be pursued was predominantly depended upon the metropolitan uh, medical practice and as well as the inquisitiveness and innovativeness of the practitioners in Bengal. Now, while probing for the uh, ideal medication, we, say, we may find that there was a linear pattern of development in the diagnosis of disease. Uh, the introduction of dissection, then recording of the medical case histories, evaluation of medication through arithmetic observation and experimental analysis, etc. It signified the evolution of Western medicine under the English company. In fact, English company also has to be credited for uh, building up the very body of Western medicine in India, because uh, we may find that uh, uh, the Calcutta Medical College and Hospital 
the Native Medical Institution, the Medical and Physical Society in all the three presidencies, whether in Calcutta, Bombay, Madras, they were all founded under the company. So the entire, the edifice, the edifice, the very structure of Western medicine actually took shape under the English company. And though we were, one may find that the merits of its medications were meant to cater to the Europeans, still the Indian patients were not altogether overlooked. Uh, through the company's dispensaries, the Indian febrile patients were medicated with indigenous medicines, which was chiefly, uh, it can be said to uh, popularize the Western medicine to them. Though we may find a racist nature in the treatment process, yet given the escalating uh, figures of death and also the fact that company as a colonial power had some economic restrictions. So the company chose a pattern of heterogeneous medication with the merits being delivered to the white body and sustainable medicaments left for the black body. Now here I end it. Thank you very much, Tricia, for that fascinating overview of a very critical part <clears throat> of medical development in India. Um, I invite everyone uh, in attendance to post questions in the chat, which I will then relay to Tricia. And I will start with, with one question related to the indigenous medicines that you mentioned, particularly in the second phase uh, that you were examining. What type of therapeutic effects did those indigenous medicines have? And were they similar to Peruvian bark? Okay, uh, they were similar to Peruvian bark. In fact, uh, Piddington found uh, that many of the medicines like uh, Chireta, Bulanj and Rohuna, uh, they were uh, they had some better qualities than the Sincona Peruvian Sincona bark. But the main problem with these medicines was that they were very much bitter. Chireta is uh, even used in today uh, for this Corona. Many people had been taking Chireta. Okay, this is very bitter. So most of the patients they complained about this bitterness. It was far bitter than uh, the Sincona. And as regards the therapeutic abilities, they, uh, it was found, in fact, in 1871, um, these uh, medicines, the Indian medicines, they were, uh, they were seen to possess uh, similar qualities uh, like the Peruvian Sincona bark, but still they never replaced the Peruvian Sincona bark. From after the uh, revolt of 1857 in, uh, under the British crown in India, 1858, we see that uh, Sincona cultivation was introduced in India under Markham. One uh, question actually relates to what you just said. Um, uh, Gabriella says, thank you for the talk. And her question is, were they able to cultivate Sincona on Indian soil? And I'd be curious as to where in India they could do that cultivation. She asks, what were the local challenges if they did? And if not, why not? Okay. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, uh, this uh, cultivation of Sincona took place in southern part of the country, um, that is uh, in Tamil Nadu region, uh, because it was found apt, uh, the temperature was found apt there. And few, um, basically the Sincona uh, cultivation took place in India in different parts. Few uh, Sincona cultivation uh, took place in Darjeeling area, that is in the hill area. And they are uh, very, um, uh, basically it required very less rainfall. And um, so in the hill areas uh, of Darjeeling and also in Tamil Nadu region, in both these places, the Sincona cultivation took place, but only after uh, 1857. Before 1857, efforts had been uh, undertaken by J.F. Royal uh, from 1852 onwards. Under his initiative, uh, seeds, Sincona plants were brought from uh, uh, South America, but they could not survive the voyage. So before 1856, in fact, seeds under the uh, under Piddington, he also um, tried to uh, germinate the seeds in India, but uh, they failed. It was only after uh, 1858 that uh, Sincona cultivation took place in the southern part of the country and also in uh, hilly regions, especially Darjeeling area. Was the cultivation controlled by the company or was cultivation private? 
uh, the cultivation was controlled by the government actually because after 1857 uh, the company rule ended and it was controlled by the government another question from uh, the audience who says uh, linda says interesting talk thank you what happened to the use of opium in treating marsh fevers in bengal did they continue to use it after the 1790s no, opium was uh, used only by uh, Francis Bafu and uh, only uh, the only medicine that was uh, used, uh, means only medicament that was used was calomel and uh, it was replaced, uh, later it was replaced by uh, this cinchona bark and for the Indians it was uh, the Indian medicaments were used and only Francis Bafu for uh, used it uh, with uh, uh, Francis Bafu only used um, for all the vigorous cases of fevers, he used uh, opium along with uh, uh, Peruvian bar. I have uh, another question about indigenous medicine. Uh, would traditional medical care have involved purgatives or did traditional healers recognize the danger of purgatives? Uh, can you just repeat it? I just uh, didn't understand it. I, I I was wondering if in 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 traditional Indian medicine at the time, if if local medicines like calomel that would require purging, uh, was that traditionally used, or did traditional healers recognize that the that was dangerous? Uh, the traditional medicines actually uh, uh, in this period. Uh, I have come across very less about uh, the traditional, I mean, the Ayurvedic practitioners. Basically, um, uh, there are pretty uh, less sources that I have got. Probably in the archives, I have not been able to access the archives since uh, 2020. And this is the main problem, even in my dissertation, that I'm not able to produce good archival sources. Uh, but um, this uh, regarding this uh, traditional medicines uh, regarding the ayurvedic practitioners what was their point of view this uh, is really that uh, i don't have answer accurate answer to this question another question from uh, the audience what was the tone or nature reporting for reserving cinchona for company soldiers and officers and not administrating on natives uh, actually, they did so because uh, the native body was considered to be quite big body. And uh, Shaughnessy's uh, Bengal dispensatory, the account which I have mentioned, in Shaughnessy's Bengal dispensatory, he mentions that uh, this cinchona, uh, when uh, it was given to people, uh, given to patients in a very high dosage, it caused... Uh, quite uh, much headaches and it caused, uh, it means the body uh, felt as if so, uh, uh, you know, fireworks were going in front of eyes. The body felt very weak. And this, since the Indian body was considered to be uh, quite, they, uh, they were considered to have uh, possessed very weak constitution. So basically, uh, cinchona was avoided uh, for their treatment. But um, from 1860, when the Bordhaman fever broke out, uh, the cinchona and the cinchona cultivation uh, took place in a wide scale, a wide scale uh, manner. At that juncture, cinchona was given to all the people, and it was given in to such an extent that people were resistant, became resistant to cinchona. This mm -hmm. being the problem. Uh, we have time for one more question, um, and this is. Were there parts of indigenous healing practices that had equal or greater efficacy to the effectiveness of Western medicine? Or did they show different efficacy or with fewer deleterious side effects? Or did they show potential with further study? Okay, very good question. And um, they had, uh, basically they showed efficacy uh, with fear, with less side effects and they had the potential for further study. In fact, uh, E.J. Waring, after this revolt uh, under British Crown's rule, E.J. Waring, he, uh, he uh, produced the Indian pharmacopoeia. He produced a work and where he showed that many Indian medicines had the potential 
uh, to uh, replace many of the Western medicines. In fact, in the British pharmacopoeia, many Indian medicines were also incorporated. But in the practice in India, Indian medicines were never used by uh, Indian medicines were never employed by the Western surgeons. Well, thank you, Tricia Halder, for your presentation today. I appreciate your time, especially it is so late in the evening where you are. And thank you to everyone who attended today's webinar. And for more information about upcoming spring speaker series, please go to www.medicalheritage.org. Thank you all very much.